Hello everybody, I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. And I'm here with Associate Professor Neil Pembrook, who's going to talk about his new book, A Spiritual Formation in Local Faith Communities. Before we get started, just want to acknowledge the uh, traditional lands that we meet and acknowledge our elders past, present and emerging. And because this talk will be about um, building spiritual formation, I just want to reference um, the work that's done in Indigenous communities to build their uh, Indigenous um, spiritual formation. Uh, Professor, take it away. Thanks, David. Thanks, everyone. It's great to be with you. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to talk about this book, uh, which has just been published. Um, and it's the, the fruit of a three-year research project, a very practical project uh, with four international colleagues who I'll introduce in a minute. So I'll just share the screen because I've got a PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so there is uh, the book, Spiritual Formation and Local Faith Communities, a whole person prompt card approach. Uh, and you can see that there are five authors, so we all work together on it. I'll introduce them more fully in a minute. Um, so let me just, if I can move this out of the way so I can see what's going on better. Um, the, these are the team members. Uh, so I'm, as you can see, at the University of Queensland, although uh, I'll be moving to Trinity College, Queensland, uh, which is just a, a suburb away in, in a couple of, couple of weeks' time, uh, the end of June. Um, Professor Jan Albert Vandenberg, University of Free State in Bloemfontein. Bill Schmid, uh, who's a professor of Pastoral Studies in Chicago, uh, Theo Pleitzia, Assistant Professor of Practical Theology in the Netherlands, and Ewan Kelly, who lectures in healthcare chaplaincy in Glasgow, Scotland. That's the team. Um, we're, we're all interested in this overlap between uh, pastoral care and spiritual formation because we see that uh, the spiritual, the psychological, and the moral are all uh, linked together and can't be separated. That, that's what unites us, and, and that's the, the approach that we took. So it's holistic in that sense. I'll talk a lot more about that in, in a minute. Uh, and it's also a very structured approach because we, we all believe that um, it's not helpful to have a, a very ad hoc approach when it comes to spiritual formation. So that's just a little bit by way of introduction. Um, so the genesis of the model, where did this start? Well, quite a few years ago now, when I was starting out in pastoral ministry, I read a book by Eugene Peterson, Working the Angles, where he, he said that pastors are not shopkeepers. And what he meant by shopkeepers is that in the, the American church, and I would say at that time, certainly true of the Australian church and other Western churches as well, there's this idea that um, almost like parishioners are consumers, they have um, desires that they want and needs they want met, and the effect of church, the growing church is the church that packages up great programs to meet their needs. Um, and Peterson said, this is not the right model for ministry. Ministry is a calling to be a person of prayer, to read scripture and to give spiritual direction. That really shocked me because I'd, I'd been trained uh, in this method of being a, a ministerial shopkeeper, even though I would not have used that language. I, I just took it for granted that what I was being trained in as a way of doing ministry and the way of being church in the modern world was the way it, it really needs to be. So when I was doing my internship uh, as part of my theological training, we're in quite a big church and the, the wife of the, the senior minister uh, said to us in one of the leaders meetings that we're all going to go out now and do local surveys because 
We want to find out the needs of the community and we're going to meet those needs. And if it turns out that what most people want is training for their toddlers, toilet training for their toddlers, that's what we'll provide. Um, so it was this kind of needs-driven approach and a program-driven church. We need a program for young adults. They've got little kids. We need a program for youth. We need a program for seniors. And we had all these programs running. Um, and we're a very busy, active church. So that kind of idea that there's another way to do ministry, which to me was much more authentic and appealing, the, the light bulb was really switched on. That was the start of this idea about how to do ministry and not to be a, a, a clerical shopkeeper. Um, then I was asked in 2004 to give an address to the Centre for Religious Development in Adelaide. Um, Centre for Religious Development started in the US and they, the, the person who invited me gave me a, a copy of a book by two Catholic spiritual directors, um, Barry and Connolly, I think William Barry and William Connolly, and she said, this is the Bible. You've got to read this and understand it if you to know what our people are about. So I read it, and I was quite troubled by the way that they separated off spiritual direction from other ministries and, and didn't want to see any overlap at all. Um, so one of the case studies they gave, a woman comes along, she's wanting spiritual direction, and part of her story is that she's uh, having an affair and you know, finding it quite um, stimulating and refreshing and new and exciting, uh, but at the same time thinking this is a, a, a bad thing morally to, to be cheating on my husband. Um, so the, the thing that sort of shocked me was that the spiritual director says, um, well, you know, that kind of moral issue is something else that we picked up elsewhere. Uh, I'm just interested in your prayer life and your God relationship. And I thought, well, how can you separate that issue, moral issue, from her spiritual formation and spiritual direction? It didn't make sense to me. And so I, I gave a talk about a holistic approach that brought together the psychological, the spiritual, and the moral uh, as all part of what we do in ministry. Uh, and then I, so I wrote a book subsequently, Moving Towards Spiritual Maturity, Psychological, Contemplative, and Moral Challenges in Christian Living, which formally laid out those ideas for a more academic audience. So, once I started doing work for that book and, and subsequent work, I noticed that other scholars were thinking about this kind of idea as well. So in the US, you had pastoral theologians like um, Don Browning, Gaylord Noyce, uh, Rebecca Miles, Donald Capps, and many others who were saying that the moral and the psychological needed to be handled together. There's a moral context for pastoral counseling. Bill Smid, who as you saw is a team member, has written a book where he talks about spiritual pilgrimages, helping one to cope with grief and loss. And he, he actually got the idea to write the book out of his own experience. He was going through that feeling, those feelings of grief and loss and went on a spiritual pilgrimage himself. And it was very renewing and healing for him. Uh, Peter Gooby, who is a professor of pastoral theology at University of Chester in, in England um, and helped us when we were working up the original model, uh, had some very helpful suggestions and wrote a back cover endorsement for our book. He's written two books, Spiritual Accompaniment and Counseling and What Counselors and Spiritual Directors Can Learn From Each Other. So spiritual direction, counseling, uh, psychological issues all belong together. Um, a very important person for us in writing our book was the theological ethicist, ethicist moral theologian, William Spohn, um, American, and he says that training in moral virtue, virtue and spirituality are very closely linked. So th these are all people that are talking about a holistic approach to ministry in one way or the other, a holistic approach to spiritual formation. 
Um, so our argument is that when you work with a person, you can't neatly separate out personal psychology, moral issues, and spirituality. So the metaphor is that the three containers leak into each other. Um, each one has its particular focus, so that they're, they're quite distinct in the sense that psychology is about intrapsychic and interpersonal dynamics. The moral life is about what is right and true and good and virtuous. Um, and spirituality is about prayer, worship, and the God relationship. So they have their distinctive focus, but there's also a lot of overlap. That, that's our main idea. So the, the model we develop is six sessions where a, a pastor uh, or some other ministry agent works with a person intensively over six weeks. Um, we also, in the book, we, we say this could be done as group work, and we suggest how it could be a group model approach. But we, the, we tested it and ran it as a pilot with just a ministry agent and um, a, a, a parishioner, one-on-one. -on -one. Six sessions. The final session, one of the things we asked the parishioners to do in those final sessions is to think about how can you integrate all of the, this, these three areas as you've reflected on what's been happening to you over, over the six weeks, the, the psychological, the moral, and the spiritual? Um, let, let me give you a sample card. So the, the subtitle of the book refers to a prompt card approach. So the, the parishioners get, at the start of the, the process, they get the um, three so four packs of cards, and the four packs of cards cover spiritual practices, spiritual character, moral virtue, and emotional well-being. So four packs of cards, 11 cards. Ten of the cards look just like this, where there's some practice or some virtue or some psychological trait that's referred to. The 11th card is what we call a wild card because... This, this means that if none of the issues are really the big issues for the person, they can bring the blank card along and say, this is, I want to talk about something else. Um, but just to give you an exam example of a typical card, they all begin with in reflecting on this aspect of my Christian life. Do I, do I need to explore it further at the session with the ministry agent? Sabbath keeping, God's gift of regular routine of rest, the time given to us to celebrate life in the world around us, and to simply be with God, a time for being in the midst of a world of doing. So a person might look at the uh, ten other, the nine other cards uh, and think out of all of those other spiritual practices, this is the one that's really speaking to me at the moment because I'm busy, I rush around doing all kinds of things. There's no time for just being with God. So I need to reflect on that with my pastor What's going on? Why is this the case? How can I make a change? That's the sort of process. It's a prayerful reflection on these cards where God leads you to want to talk about an issue in more depth. Um, here, here would be another example of a card, this time from the moral domain. Um, in reflecting on this aspect of my Christian life, do I need to explore it further at the session? Solidarity, a firm ongoing determination to seek the good of all in each individual, support for opposition to all that's oppressive, and for helping everyone to live with dignity, to assert their rights, and to exercise their responsibilities. So nuts and bolts of the approach. As I said earlier, the approach consists of six sessions, approximately one hour, conducted ideally over six weeks, some in the pilot. Sometimes it was every two weeks because people got too busy. Now, the first session is clearly an orientation. This is what this process is about. This is how we, we, we plan to work together. And then the person is invited to select a set of cards to work with at the next session. It could be the 11 cards on psychological well-being. Remember, the 11th is always a wild card. So it could be the, a set of 11 cards on psychological well-being. It could be the set of 11 cards on spiritual practices or spiritual character, moral character. So they pick one set of cards to take away with them. 
could be any of those four. They'll eventually cover all four, but they start with the one that they want to start with. And then they go away with their, their 11 cards. They prayerfully reflect on them during the week. And then they, they bring one or two cards to the session. This is what I need to talk about. So the form of the conversation is pastoral and, and informal in tone. So this is not formal spiritual direction. There are people that are trained to be spiritual directors. It's a specialised ministry. But um, this is really about the pastor and the parishioner being companions on a journey together. And there's a certain mutuality about it. Um, so the pastor might talk about her or his own uh, spiritual journey and some of the things I've been learning. So it's not meant to be that formal spiritual direction. It's a pastoral conversation. It's informal. It's mutual. The closing session, the pastor invites the parishioner to consider doing some journaling. And reflecting on the session just past, what do you notice? What feelings and thoughts arise for you as you reflect on the conversation? What are you wondering about? What are you feeling curious about? Is there a light bulb moment for you? Is there an insight that seems especially important right now? So, and virtually all of the people who participated in the pilot decided they wanted to do some journaling. So it's reflecting back on the session and thinking, What's God saying to me through all of the things we talked about? You write that in a journal. At the conclusion of the second session, the parishioner is invited to select her or his second set of prompts. So I selected spiritual practices in the first session. Now I'm going to do um, moral virtue in the second session. So then they again bring one or two cards to the third session. That's the basis of the conversation. And then the process keeps going until all four packs have been worked through. And then there's a final session drawing things together. So the sixth session is a wrap up. It's a time for reflecting back and reflecting forward. The pastor might ask questions such as these. What was the most significant thing for you along this journey? What did you learn? What are the issues that will stay with you? Where to from here? And the final session is an opportunity to reinforce the holistic dimension of the process. So in other words, saying to, to a parishioner, can you see links between your conversations about your moral life, about your psychological challenges, and about um, spiritual practices and spiritual character? So can you see how th this is all linked in some way? Uh, so questions like, what connections have you noticed between the conversations in the four sessions? After our times together and your own reflection, how are you seeing your psychological life, your spiritual life, and your moral life as linked? <laughs> a funny thing about the pilot was that uh, we just gave them a blank card. So what didn't look like this? It just was a blank card. So 10 cards with things about spiritual practices or about moral virtue and so on, and then just a a totally blank card. Virtually no one in the pilot, so it's 45 people, not virtually no one realized what the blank card was for, even though we'd told the pastors, explain the blank card at the first session. So we had some interesting comments like, it was very nice of you in the feedback, it was very nice of you to give me a blank card to write my thoughts on. It was very nice of you to supply a blank card, which I use for my coffee, to put as a coaster for my coffee. <laughs> They didn't realise it was about if none of these things are speaking to you, bring your own issue that is speaking to you. So we changed it in the final in, for the book. On the card, it's got this. Feel free to bring something for reflection not covered in this set. Fill in the blank. And reflecting on, do I need to explore it further at the session? Here's some more cards from the the psychological domain, self-acceptance, holding a positive attitude towards yourself, maintaining positive self-regard despite awareness of your flaws and weaknesses and shadow side. 
positive interpersonal relations, a capacity to relate to others in a warm, generous, trusting, empathic, and loving manner. Uh, this would be from spiritual character, which is really the fruits of the spirit largely. Peace, serenity flowing from resting secure in God's unconditional love and the gift of Christ in the spirit. Um, patience, again, from spiritual character, spiritual enabled endurance in the face of strife and adversity, spiritual strength to bear up under the stresses and strains of life. From moral virtue, peaceableness, a way of life in the spirit of Christ involving the refusal to let force to use force to protect yourself, to use coercion to get your own way, or to violently resist evil when it's done to you. Um, the thing about, about the cards was that we had people from all ages. We had 16-year-olds and 80-year-olds. Um, some of them were well-educated uh, in the ways of Christian faith and um, Christian theology. Some had very little idea. Some of them told us they, they went along to see their, their pastor. They brought a card like this one and said, I don't even really know what this means. Uh, and our reflection as a group was this is a good thing. The fact that they can just come in that, that very honest way. Look, I looked at all these cards. This is the one I've picked. It seems important, but I don't even really know what it means. Can we talk about it? So that's not a bad sort of start. Um, anyhow, uh, I could say a lot more, but um, probably, probably enough to give you a sense of, of, the, of the method and what we do in the book. Yeah, just to say this in the book, um, we obviously don't spend 10 chapters just talking about each of these cards. We talk about a lot of related issues, like um, when the positive psychology movement says people should aim to be happy and to flourish. Is that a goal that Christians should embrace? If so, why? If not, why not? Um, what sort of personal characteristics should a pastor have if they're going to help people? Um, uh, trace the development of this model of, of the pastor who's interested in being a moral guide, a spiritual guide, uh, and a guide around personal well-being. Uh, is that got a long history? Well, we argue it goes right back to the early church. So a lot of issues related to the book, to the, to the method in the book, why we do the things we do and how we do them. There we go. <laughs> Thanks so much for that. One of the things that uh, fascinated me is when I read that you had these kind of um, co-authors from around the world. What was that like? Did you was there any really big differences between how we do things in Australia in church versus say America or somewhere else? Um, it's interesting you should say that, um, Dave, because when we were talking about how we would structure the book and what chapters would go in it, because we all wrote chapters for the book um, and uh, Theo Pleitz here from the Netherlands said, we need something about the transcultural because we've got five different cultures here. And even though there's some similarities between Americans and Australians and the Dutch and, and the Scottish and so on, there are also quite significant um, differences. So he offered to write a chapter, which is a wonderful chapter. Um, I mean, I, I read it very closely because English is his second language. So I had to sort out the, the English and make it sound a bit more natural for a native speaker. So I read, read it sentence by sentence and, and very closely. Um, fant fascinating work on saying, well, what are the things that are universal for Christians? And what are the things that uh, are done differently? thought differently because of the culture. Um, I mean, we, we could have gone much wider. We could have tried this in Asian cultures and African cultures and um, indigenous Australian culture, um, a whole range of cultures. Um, the, the reason we didn't do that was the limitations on us as a research team. We applied for a Templeton Foundation grant, 
um, for a few hundred thousand dollars to, to do a much bigger project. Um, but we were unsuccessful with that grant. Um, and so we, we really had to, to cut our cloth uh, and work with what we had, which was to work in our own cultures with pastors that we knew that we could call upon. Uh, and then we conducted uh, focus groups with them. So we, we talked to the pastors separately. We talked to the parishioners as a different group. Uh, and we said, okay, what, what was good about it? What could have been done better? What are your suggestions? How can we improve this? Uh, what can we learn from you? Um, so that's how we did it. And that kept us busy, you know, sort of setting up the project, running the focus groups, transcribing all of the things that were said um, into text, going through all that together, working out what we're gonna do differently how to revise the model, writing the chapters for the book, uh, you know, all without sort of the kind of funding that, that would have helped us do it, a much bigger project. Um, and with sort of spiritual formation generally, and I know this is a bit of a, a too, maybe too general, because obviously there's always exceptions to the rule, but do you think churches in Australia in particular are good at spiritual formation within their churches, because I would assume that would be the bread and butter, but you hear these stories about, you know, they're not very good at sort of outreach or maybe there's not much being offered in the church in terms of programs. What's your kind of view on that? Yeah, look, I, I think that when we did a, a bit of research in terms of what's happening um, in the Western context, as I said earlier, we couldn't go to Asian and African context. Um, but when we did research on what's happening in the Western context, including Australia, we, we found that uh, this was one area that, that a number of scholars and practitioners, pastors thought was really lacking, that um, we, we get caught up in all the busyness, busyness of church life, running committees, involved in out, outreach programs, involved in youth programs, and these are all worthy and good things. But when it comes time to, for with a pastor uh, or some other ministry agent, just giving intensive time to helping uh, a member of the church grow in their spiritual life, to become more emotionally and psychologically integrated, uh, to work on their life of Christian virtue, we find we found that wasn't happening. Um, some of the pastors that we interviewed in the focus groups said, wow, this was the most incredible thing. Um, but I couldn't sustain this. You know, I, I can't give this time to my parishioners because I'm so busy doing other things. And if I was going to keep doing this, I, I would have to restructure my whole week, my whole approach to ministry, my whole understanding of what parish ministry is. And then one of them said, quite tellingly, and I may in fact do that. So what we're arguing is that there needs to be a changing of priorities. Um, we're not saying that this is the only thing you should be doing in your week. But we are saying that mostly what happens in spiritual formation is very ad hoc. Um, pastors don't give much time to, to parishioners. We recognise that if you're in a big church, you know, the pastor can't be spending hours every day with parishioners, um, but that in big churches there are others on the ministry team. And we also said in the book that a way to reach more people is to, to do group work. Um, so there are different ways that can be done, but it does mean a restructuring of priorities. Do you think that is going to happen? You know, that kind of, that, that we can change? I, I really hope so. Um, th this, this was what really Eugene Peterson has been talking about for a long time. I mean, Working the Angles came out in you know, about 1987. So that's you know, quite a long time ago. And what he said about church life 
then is still largely true today. Um, so we, those of us that support his general vision need to keep it alive and need to keep believing. Um, and it's through exposure to you know, books like ours and books like Eugene Peterson's and many others that are talking about a renewal in our understanding of what the central calling of the, the pastor is. If the church did change or if individual churches did change, you know, reprioritize, do you, is there an appetite amongst parishioners? The reason I ask that is that I read an article recently about how, especially in the US, pastors have lost ground in terms of their authority. People don't kind of always trust them or, or value their, their opinions on moral uh, morals, for example, do you think that just the average parishioner would say, look, I don't really want that from my pastor telling me how to you know, live my life or going through that level? Of, yeah, of I, I would say two things. Um, you're right that there would be quite a few people in a congregation who would say, that's not for me. You know, I come along to church once every couple of months. Um, that's enough for me, or I come every week, but I'm, I'm just happy to get the sermon, you know, the message that that's, and I don't need any more. So th that, that's the first thing, that there would be a significant group of people for whom this is not for them. Uh, so, you know, we're not expecting and promoting this model that, that uh, a pastor would be run off her or, or his feet with people rushing to have this great opportunity. We recognise that many would say, look, you know, I haven't got time, I'm not interested, That's, I'm getting enough from, from just the regular involvement in, in church life, a sermon or I go to a Bible study. That's the first thing. The second thing is that, that we were genuinely surprised when we went into the focus groups. So there were 45 people that participated and we were genuinely surprised at the universal response of this has been fantastic for me, this has been transforming. Um, we were expecting that some would say, well, you know, it's all right, didn't really do much for me. But the enthusiasm from the parishioners uh, almost to a person was quite overwhelming. Um, People saying things like, um, this is huge. I'm just going to get it out. I haven't really prayed much for 20 years now. I'm praying very regularly. Um, others that said, you know, for the first time for a long time, I want to read my Bible more. I want to meditate more. I want to get in touch with God's calling on my life. I want to really know God better. You know, like it was just quite overwhelming, um, the response. And, and similarly from the pastors that they found a renewal of their calling through all of this. Um, the other thing was that, that the number of parishioners that said, uh, I, I'm just so honoured and privileged that I, I get, I've had this opportunity to spend an hour with my pastor one-on-one. -on -one. I know she's so busy. I know he's so busy. Um, I don't want to intrude on their time, but this is a wonderful gift that they've given me of six weeks one hour every week dedicated just to me, you know. Um, so that, they're kind of some of the reactions to your question. Do you think it's changed historically? Like I've met people who say that pastoral care is not as um, prevalent as it once was because priests are more busy. Do you think that uh, spiritual formation, and again, it's a bit of a generalised sort of question, but do you think it was better in the past or it's always kind of been lacking? Yeah, so a friend of mine, Stephen Patterson, wrote an article that was very confronting to many of us. Stephen Patterson, uh, for many years, was a professor of pastoral care in the UK, um, and he wrote this article, Is Pastoral Care Dead in the Missional Church? And his answer was, basically, it seems to be. So th this, there is a re a reaction to the numerical decline of the Christian church in the West, which is that we need to be uh, involved in evangelism, a re renewed push on evangelism, on church planting, 
on growing the church um, and that pastoral care uh, is not the focus that it, that it once was. Um, we've got a new priority. The new priority is being missional um, and you know, the, the, the pastors don't do the amount of pastoral care work that they once did. Um, and so our response would be, you know, that, that um, it's not either or, and that people's need for spiritual formation and pastoral care um, has not declined. You know, it's not that people are able to, to, to support themselves through various existential and developmental crises. Um, so we, we would be arguing that, that you need to hold those priorities together and that, that the fact that there's a renewed push on mission uh, is not an excuse to say, well, I just haven't got time for pastoral work, I haven't got for spiritual formation. What's really important is getting out there and um, bringing people to Christ. Mm -hmm. You're you saying that this uh, course sort of incorporates everything. You, you were talking about how surprised you were when the spiritual director was saying separate the two issues. Mm. Um, why do you think they do separate it? Is it just sort of it's easier just to say yeah, oh, it's, it's not my it, job? It's the disease of specialization. You know, the, the pastoral ministry really historically has been holistic. You know, we, we traced back our model right back to John Chrysostom and, and uh, the early church fathers who had the same idea. So it's always been holistic, but, you know, some pastors, particularly in the US, have got very, have fallen very much in love with this idea that, um, you know, I need to be highly trained and a specialist. So I go and do a doctor of ministry I'm now a doctor of spiritual direction. I'm a doctor of pastoral psychotherapy. Um, and so, you know, I've got this new status. Um, just as the, there are GPs and there are specialists to specialize in, in heart, in lungs, in, in whatever they specialize in. Uh, so I need to be a specialist. In my area is I'm very specialised in prayer and the God relation. I'm very specialised in psychopathology and how to heal psychopathology. You know, so all this advanced training, I've written a thesis, um, and so I'm now a formally qualified pastoral psychotherapist, I'm a formally qualified spiritual director, um, and I just think it's very unhelpful. You can't carve people up into neat little categories and neat little areas. You know, we're holistic humans, and that's why I've called it a whole person approach. It's the subtitle of our book, A Whole Person Approach. Um, so it's something I feel quite strongly about. Uh, and as you saw from my book of 2007, it's been with me a long time. This is what ministry is about, that you've got to be able to embrace all of these aspects of human life. Mm -hmm. uh, with the kind of international uh, partnerships, doing this work you you mentioned that some one of the surprise was that a lot of people uh in the workshops were in the groups were really wanted this really benefited from this were there other surprises for you working with different people from around the world that you weren't expecting um, not not really uh, i mean there, there were some very helpful suggestions um some of the suggestions from pastors was you know, what about more visual people? You know, shouldn't you have, instead of just having these cards with text on them, shouldn't you have some images like a very evocative painting, for example? Uh, others sort of said, why don't you on the back put a series of biblical texts? Um, so these were not surprising responses, uh, but they were helpful responses. Um, we, in the end, we decided that we wouldn't change because one of the things that, that Krishna seemed to really appreciate was that this was a very um, simple and straightforward process uh, because one of the things that stops the average parishioner from doing this kind of thing is they think 
or there are these elite Christians that know a lot about spiritual life and about the Bible and about theology. Now, that's for them. You know, I'm too simple-minded to, to be part of that. So we wanted to reach out to people who um, might tend to think spiritual formation is for elite Christians. So we want to keep it simple, but we did say in our book that by all means, if pastors uh, want to give out the set of cards and then also say, here's a set of, of images, some paintings, um, for example, some sculptures you know, to reflect on, do that. If others want to print off cards and on the back put a series of Bible verses, by all means, do that. So obviously people will do with it what they want, um, but we, we didn't feel a need to then revamp the whole method and, and make it more complicated. We wanted to keep it simple because that seemed to be one of the strengths. It's interesting that you say that, that people have this perception that, oh, well, that kind of theology is high end, so that's not for me. Do you think that is a big thing, say, in Australia, that people feel like they can't really explore faith because that's only for those experts? Yeah, I, I think that is often a uh, something that holds people back that you know they they do think that there, there are these elite Christians um, and that the ordinary person in the pew uh, needs to keep things very simple and just uh, keep you know keep it, the sermon quite straightforward and simple and and you know I, I've found that when you give people a bit of encouragement and uh, ask them to take a step that great things happen. So that's, that was a story that we, we heard a number of times. We asked the pastors to invite parishioners, so they invite a particular parishioner. Parishioner says, oh, my goodness, no, I've never even been in Bible study. I couldn't do that. Pastor says, Sarah, yes, you can. Yes, you can. How about it? Oh, okay. Very tentative. Joins in the process with some fear, some trepidation, finds that this has been absolutely fantastic for them. Not as threatening as they thought. The pastor gave them permission to talk about whatever they wanted to talk about. It was not directive. It was not judgmental. Uh, it was very supportive. It was very open. It was very friendly. Uh, and they, they got a chance to, to think and to pray and to reflect about things that, that they'd never done before because no one had given them the opportunity or the encouragement. So that pastor that you mentioned before who said, oh, I think it's lovely, but I couldn't sustain this. What do you say to a pastor that will say that to you now? So, look, Professor, you know, I'd love to do this, but let's get real. Um, I don't have the time to do it. Yeah, well, in the, in the book, we address it very specifically and we put out a challenge that it's time to change your priorities. Um, that not, not, as I said, to make this what you do all day, every day. That's completely unrealistic. Um, but to change your priorities so that you've got time, and we actually specify how in an average congregation you, you could make time to make this work and how many hours you might need to devote to it. And we believe that that, that would be realistic, but it is a, a changing of priorities. It's a matter of letting some things go, things that you might have thought were were terribly important and couldn't possibly be let go. Well, it turns out they can be. This, this was Eugene Peterson's challenge. You know, your shopkeepers that are working 70 hours a week, keeping the shop ticking over with all these wonderful programs, meeting all the consumer needs. Uh, actually, you need to only worry about some, some very fundamental things. You need to be a person of prayer. You need to be a person who reads scripture. You need to be a person to give spiritual direction to your parishioners. And for parishioners who do this, um, what happens after those, those lessons? Where do they go to after they've done it? Yeah, well, that's something that's talked about in the final session. And one of the things that came out repeatedly in the focus groups was with the parishioners was that we'd love to keep this going. Um, but it would be selfish of us to call on the pastor, you know, to revisit the cards as much as I might love to do that. 
So why don't we get a group going? So that's, that's one of the things we address in the book. Mm -hmm. Group work means that the whole process can keep going without um, being unrealistic in terms of how much time a ministry agent could give. And we give a, in one of the appendices, we give a whole um, series of steps and, and guidance about how to run a good group to keep this all going. So group work is the, the obvious thing to, to do. You want the pastor there at the start, but after that, it's okay to just go on without the pastor. Yeah, and, and a pastor could choose to run it with a group um, and, and not, to, not do any one-to-one, -one, but just run a series of groups mm -hmm. and do the same kind of thing. In fact, when I first tried this, I tried it with a group and it worked pretty well. The downside is that um, people tend not to be as honest and, and as open to truth-telling because there are other people there and they're worried about being judged. So it's very hard to get people to be confident enough to, be, to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you mentioned the age differences. So from you know, young people to 80 year olds, were there any big differences in how they experienced this program? Look, I think, I think the younger people, um, for them, it was a real eye-opener because these were uh, things that even though uh, for many of us, we, we've been used to these ideas for a very long time, for many of the younger people, it was quite revolutionary. You know, 16, 17, 18 year olds. Um, but these were new concepts, things like being peaceable, being in solidarity, Sabbath keeping, um, the, the kind of classic virtues of, of prudence and courage and temperance. And these were all very new concepts. So they were, they were quite um, overwhelmed, I think, but, but also excited because they realised that there was so much more to Christianity than they'd thought. Yeah. I really like the solidarity uh, car that really speaks, yeah. I think, um, quite strongly. To yeah, like. we, we, we tried to have a mixture of classic spiritual disciplines and spiritual practices, spiritual character from the fruits of the spirit, and more contemporary things like, let's think of ecological care as a spiritual practice. Let's think about solidarity with the oppressed as a moral virtue, you know. Um, so th there's a bit of a mixture there. It, it, you know, it's not all contemporary ideas and it's not all traditional ideas, but there's a nice blend, I think. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for talking to us about the book and for writing the book with your, with your co-authors. Uh, we really appreciate you joining. And for those that are going to watch this later on, if you are sitting there watching and going, why doesn't David ask the professor this question or that question? You can still ask the question, just get in contact with us and we'll yeah. forward on the, the question to uh, the professor and he'll give you an answer. Um, thank you again, professor, for yeah, uh, joining. You, Thank you, David. Thank you for having me, everyone. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. All the very best. God bless.